into the Christmas story from John chapter 3. If you have your Bible, you can open there. Um, What are some enduring images or symbols or pictures of the Christmas story that you remember? Anybody want to take a shot at it? The major, yes. What else? Star, yes. What else? The shepherds, absolutely. Shepherds watching by night, right? What else? What? What? Christmas tree? No, no, that's the wrong story. Um, Okay, so what the Christmas story does is it gives us some enduring pictures to help us to understand a bigger idea. The big idea is not all the symbols, it's not all those elements. The idea is that God's one and only Son has come to live among us. He came to die for us. And so the whole Advent story is about that right there. So tomorrow night, we're going to talk about some of the symbols, but today we're going to look at not so much the what, but the why. Why does God send his one and only son? And that story is full of irony. It's full of irony. Think about it. This story is about the God who is infinite in nature, who is from everlasting to everlasting. John 1 1 says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word is eternal, everlasting. He is from the beginning with God, which means before beginning began, he was. And this God who is infinite in nature takes on finite form. The God who is the creator of all things, who called all things into existence, everything in the spectrum of reality. The creator God, John 1, 3 says, all things were created by him and apart from him, nothing, nothing was created that has been created. And this creator God now becomes a part of his creation, becomes born as a man like you and I. The God who is the author of life. John 1, 4 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And this God who is himself, life and light, comes here. And he becomes subject to human death, even death on a Roman cross by Roman law. This God who is, as to his nature, essentially spirit. He's not a physical being. God is spirit. John 4, 24 said to the Samaritan woman, God is spirit. And the people who are the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit and in truth. And what does he do? This God who is an everlasting spirit takes upon himself human bodily form. The God who is the sovereign ruler over all, the king of the universe. Matthew 2, 6 says this, and you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are in no way least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a sovereign ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And this sovereign ruler, this king of the universe, chooses to become a man and subject to the kingdoms of men for a time. This God who is pure and holy. John 1, 6 says, And the light shines out of the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it or has not mastered it. This God in whom there is not a shadow, a shade, a hint of darkness comes here and becomes the sin offering on a cross for you and for me. Now that story is filled with irony. That story is filled with reversals, great reversals. So the main idea today is this, is that the story of God's advent, the story of God coming, Emmanuel, God with us, is a shocking narrative about how God does something that no one expects him to do. This God who is fully God and in Christ is fully human. These two natures wed together. These two natures in unison in one person. But why? John 3 tells us why. John 3, 16 through 18, says this. For this is the way God loved the world. So God so loved the world this way. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. 
The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe in him has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. How much does God love the world? I want to unpack this passage for you. I want to show you that the, that the Advent story does not just come to us in these rich, beautiful symbols like the manger and the star and the shepherds and the wise men. It comes to us in rich wording. And I want to unpack these words. First of all, let's look at God's love. For this is the way, he says, God loved the world. The verbal form of the word love is the word agape or agapeo. And that word is a famous word. Many of us have learned it and know it. And here's what it means. The word for love he uses here, agape, means to have a warm regard for, to have a strong affection to highly esteem and cherish something or someone. That's what it means. It means to have a warm regard. It means to have a strong affection for, to highly esteem or cherish something or someone. God's love, we learn, is not fickle. God's love is not silly infatuation. It is not fleeting or temporary. It is not fatuous or shallow. God's love is a deep, abiding Lasting affection and regard. God's love is powerful and it's enduring. But what does God love? He loves the world. What do we mean when we say God loves the world? The word world here is the word cosmos. What word do we get from that word? Cosmos. We get the word cosmos from that word. And yes, and sometimes it, do, it is a general reference to the heavens and the earth. That was their phrase for universe. They didn't use the word universe. They said the heavens and the earth. And so the word cosmos means, can sometimes generally refer to the entirety of the world. And for sure, God loves his world. In creation, the creation account in Genesis, he declares it good. As a matter of fact, before he's all done, he he declares it very good. God loves his world. God has a plan according to Romans chapter 8 and Revelation 20 and 21. God has a plan to renovate the world. God loves the world, sure. But what does God love in this passage, in this chapter? The context is you. God loves people. God loves all people. And his love is not limited to a tribe, to an ethnicity, to a nation, a political party, to a religion. God's love is not restricted to good people versus bad people or sinners versus saints or unchurched versus churchgoers. No. God loves everyone. God loves the whole world. For God had such deep and abiding regard for. He had such strong and enduring affection. He so highly esteemed and valued the people of the world that he loves so much. He loved them so much that he gave. God gave us the ultimate gift. But what was it? First of all, let's look at this word give. Normally the idea of giving a gift is expressed by the word grace. The word grace is just a translation of the word charis. Uh, If you have named your daughter Carissa, or I've heard the name charisma, uh, that word just means grace. That's Paul's favorite word for God's gift of salvation that he has given us. That's Paul's favorite term, but that is not the word that John uses here. He does not use the word charis. He doesn't use the word grace as an act of unmerited favor. He uses the word ditto me. The word ditto me, what does this word mean? That word comes from the financial sector of Roman culture. It's transactional. Here's what it means. It means to take a great sum of money or something that is highly valued and precious and to entrust it to the care of someone else, someone who is trusted by you. Think about that. Now, God didn't just give us the gift of salvation. God doesn't just give us this free gift, this unmerited gift of salvation. God entrusts the most precious thing he has, his son, to us. Now, it's one thing for you to give a gift to someone that you know is going to be just just go sideways, just lose their mind with gratitude over that gift. How many of you guys are giving gifts to little kids uh, on Christmas morning? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, we, we still do that, but our kids aren't little anymore. And when they were, the other day, I, I um, 
opened up on my, on my Dropbox folder, I opened up a really old video of them probably seven or eight years ago opening gifts. Now, now they're all kind of teenagers and preteens, and so they're just, they're just grumpy all the time. You know, you know how it is. But when they were really little, uh, there was this one particular Christmas, we just got them exactly what they wanted, right? And so this, this is what happens. For those of you who don't know, they tear it open, everything, lay it all out. Get the gifts down on the floor. And then you can see in the video, they're so engrossed in the gift. They just don't know anything else exists. And they play with it for a little while. But then something really cool starts to happen. A little kid crawls up in your lap and kisses you on your face and says, Thank you, Daddy, for getting this. Oh, it's a wonderful picture. That's the way it ought to be. You ought to be able to give someone a gift, to be able to entrust something precious or something costly to them and have them enjoy it, but also come back and say, thank you. I'm so grateful for it. Now think about how God gives. Think about how God gives. God, here's, what does God know? God knows that he is going to give the most precious gift to us that he can possibly give, and that is the Son of God, who is also God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. And he is going to entrust him to our care. And most of the people who encounter his life and his ministry and his grace and his mercy will spit in his face. And what does Paul say in Romans 5? We read it this morning. It says, while, this is how God demonstrates his love for us. This is how. God demonstrates his love for us. And while we were yet sinners, while we were still languishing, dead in our sins, Christ died for the ungodly. He does not wait for us to get our act together. He does not wait for us to become perfect. He doesn't wait. He dies for us while we are still in our sins, lost and headed for a Christless eternity. God is a giver. God gave his one and only son. He doesn't just give any son or he just doesn't give anything. He gives his best. He gives his one and only. How do we know this is the one and only? Because of the word monogenes. You can write that down. Isn't that a nice theological term? See, you're learning all kinds of Greek this morning. Isn't this great? Merry Christmas. Thanks, Pastor Jeff. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I have some super nerds in here that are writing all this down. Monogenes, the word genes or genas means one kind or a category, a kind. That's what it means. It just means a kind or a category or a species. The word mono means what? One. This word literally means of a singular kind. It literally means the only one of its class, kind, or category. There is no other. There are all kinds of words that John could have used here, but the word that he uses is to say there is only one son. One son. Now, you and I, when we come to faith, very, very much so, you and I are adopted into the family of God. God is your father, and Jesus told you to pray that way. God is your father who art in heaven. You have been adopted and brought into his family, the family of the beloved son. You have been in chapter three right here. He tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again. You have to have an existential transformation of the heart in order to enter the kingdom of God or you will not enter the kingdom of God. So in a very real sense, you and I are sons and daughters of the living God, but not like this. There is only one son. From eternity. There is only one son who is the word. He is the only one of his kind, class, or category. And God so highly esteemed the people of the world, all of them, that he entrusted his most precious gift, his one and only son, so that everyone. The word everyone here is a very simple term. It's the word pan. It's where we get the prefix prefix pan, which means what? means everything. means everything, all, everyone. It's, where we get the, uh, it's what we use when we use the word panoramic. What's a panoramic view? An all-encompassing wide view. What's a pandemic? A pandemic is not just an epidemic. A pandemic is spread far and wide, right? So this is the idea here. It's everyone. It's all. Whosoever will. Whosoever comes. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It does not matter. Everyone who comes to the Son, and he says, who believes in him. 
So this is not just some universal statement of salvation for all, though this passage has been used that way. That's not what it means. It is a universal invitation to all. It is the universal call to salvation to all. Those, to those who believe in him, they receive salvation. This is no vague call to some unclear or unspecified religious life of devotion. Believe is the word pistuo. There's another one for you. It's the word pistuo. And there are three aspects to this word for believe in the New Testament. Christian faith is essentially made up of these three dimensions. The first one is cognitive. The first one is intellectual. You and I come to cognitive agreement over what? Over the propositional content of the gospel. You and I come to the gospel and we agree with the story as it is told. What's the story? The story is very simple. That God's, God the Son was embodied in a human life. That's Emmanuel, God with us. That Jesus of Nazareth lived a sinless life, demonstrating the power of the kingdom of God on a daily basis. And that he was tried as a blasphemer by the Sanhedrin. He was tried as a revolutionary by the Roman government. And he was crucified, crucified on a Roman cross for our sins. And on the third day, he rose bodily from the grave to vindicate his claims of lordship over the entire world. And he has ascended bodily to the Father in heaven. He has ascended to the Father, the right hand of power in heaven, from which he will come to judge the living and the dead. Amen. And he will set up his earthly rule, and you and I will reign and rule with him for eternity. Now, that's the gospel. I mean, that's just it in a nutshell. Those are just the six or seven pillars of this gospel story. And part of the Christian faith, part of Christian faith is to believe the propositional content of that story. To know that it is true. But beyond affirming intellectually, coming into cognitive alignment with the story we awaken spiritually to it so even a skeptic can look at all my bullet points there in my notes and go yeah that's what christians believe he may even be able to know it well enough to argue against it but he doesn't believe it well you can know it and not believe it you could be able to rattle it off by heart by memory and still not believe the story but this is where the holy spirit comes in what does the holy spirit do well he comes in and he awakens the dead soul paul says in ephesians 2 you and i are dead in our sins we are dead in our trespass transgressions transgressions trespasses there we go that is not a greek word by the way so um we're dead we start out in this life spiritually estranged from god the scripture tells us that, that we, do, we no longer have the faculties to really discern the truth. Now, we may be able to know it. We may be able to memorize the points of it. But we can't see it spiritually as truth because the eyes of the heart have not been enlightened. You and I have a deadened spiritual faculty. We have been born into this world with a cognitive inability to really affirm what God says is true. And so the Holy Spirit comes to awaken, awaken our souls to the truth and to cause us, to give us the power to affirm it as actually true. Number three, we entrust ourselves to it. But we don't just affirm it cognitively. We don't just intellectually say, yes, that is the Christian story. We don't just say, oh boy, that's true. Come to the spiritual realization that it's true. We also then put our trust in it. It's the, the best illustration I can give is getting on a plane. My dad lived his entire life never flying. We traveled a couple of times across the entire United States. Once when they moved to San Diego and once when we moved from San Diego to uh, Virginia, he would not fly. Now, my father intellectually knew that planes take off and they land safely every single day. But that wasn't the issue for him. You see, until you walk the corridor and hand in your ticket and get in your seat and buckle up and take the plane, you don't really trust it yet. And it's one thing to know it. It's one thing for the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to the content of the faith, the accurate content of the faith, the true gospel. That's one thing. But you got to take the ride. You got to get on. You got to take the entirety of your life and entrust your very self to this man, this one, the one and only son. That's Christian faith. 
And what happens to people who do that? Scripture says, so that they would not perish. They would not perish. This is not God's will for anyone to perish. This word of per- perish is the word apalumi. Uh, that word has no relation to English whatsoever, but I'll tell you what it means. It means to cause destruction. It means to bring to utter ruin. This word is very interestingly used in some nautical contexts in the ancient world where it's used to describe a horrendous shipwreck. And what happens is the ship is battered. The seafarers are battered by the wind and the storm. And the storm drives them to the rocky shoals of the sandbar. And there they lodge and they cannot move. And there's a gaping hole in the bow of their ship. And they can no longer do what they were designed to do. Sail in a vessel that was designed to be seaworthy. It's come to utter ruin. It's come to utter wreckage. And this is the idea of perishing, you and I perishing apart from the life of God, coming to a point in our existence, in eternity, where we have perished or are permanently estranged from the life of God. Perishing is unbelief of God's true son. We become shipwrecked for all eternity, life wrecked, still men, still women, but not able to be the image bearing men and women that he's called us to be. And he says here in verse 18, uh, the one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe in him, the one and only son, has been condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. And so this person does not agree. This person has not been enlightened. This person has not placed the trust of their entire life in this one and only son. I thank God for the science of genetics. Don't you? I, I... once in a while, I, I, just about every day, I get up and I flip through uh, <clears throat> my news app on my phone. And once in a while, I come across a story where uh, someone has used genetics to overturn a verdict. And someone who's been in prison for 15 or 20 years gets released. And I, I'm so saddened that that person had to do 15 years hard time, even because they were unjustly accused. But the forensics, the evidence has freed them. Did you know that people who study this say that between 1% to 2% of those who are incarcerated in prisons are actually innocent? They're innocent. They shouldn't be there. When, when I was much younger, I used to go every month to a local prison, and I used to visit the chapel there. And I could tell you, every month when I would just share the scriptures and share my story and get into a discussion and share my faith with these prisoners, I can tell you that the people who think they're innocent in prison, it's much higher than 1% to 2%. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I have never seen more self-righteousness than in prison. Everyone, just about, just seven out of three people in there will tell you, well, I shouldn't be in here. I should, it's like 70%. That's a disparity. And so here's, here's what I have learned, is that the, the good news involves some bad news. There's some bad news. Here it is. And that we already have the bad news. Jesus didn't come to give us the bad news. Jesus came to give us the good news. But the bad news is this. You and I, in Adam, have been born into sin. And the scripture says we stand condemned already. And if you do not believe in the one and only son of God, you will remain in your state of condemnation. That's the bad news. Self-righteousness is denying that that's a fact. The Pharisees didn't want to admit that. People in prison don't want to admit that they have committed the crimes and that's why they're doing the time. And you and I in a spiritual prison of self-righteousness will not admit that we are sinful enough to justify and warrant Eternal separation from God, but that's what the Bible teaches. You and I will be condemned because we already are. But then God's purpose is what? To send the Son, His one and only Son, to us to tell us there's actually great news. There's good news. And that is you don't have to be. You can be reconciled back to God. God's will is not to condemn you. He didn't send his one and only son to condemn you, to pronounce it over you. He came to save you from it. You're already drowning in the middle of the ocean. Take hold of the life preserver. Don't deny that it's there or that you're drowning. Take it. Receive it. Receive this wonderful gift. Romans 5.17 says this, For if by the transgression of one man, that's Adam in that context, If by the transgression of one man, death reigned through the one. 
How much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ? You see what he's saying? He's saying, in Adam, death was introduced into the human experience, and now death has reigned. Separation from God has reigned. And now in Christ, life reigns, and this leads us to our next one, eternal life. Eternal life. What do we mean when we say a believer has eternal life? There are a couple of aspects to this that you need to know. The first one is longevity of life. The first one has to do with quantity of life has to do with lifespan. It's immeasurable. Uh, the word, the Greek word is zoe ionian. Zoe ionian means life of the age. The life that characterizes the kingdom age. And the life that characterizes the kingdom age, you can write this down, is in perpetuity. It's forever. The span of life never ends. You and I have the guarantee that when we put our trust and our faith and cognitively agree with this gospel and put our lives in Jesus and entrust him with our eternity, you can know that you know. You can have an assurance in your heart and know that you will live forever with God. And that's the second aspect of eternal life, which is the qualitative John 10, 10, Jesus says, the thief, he's referring to the Pharisees, he says, the thieves come to steal, kill, and destroy. Religious people will steal your joy. They will kill your faith. They will destroy your hope. That's what he's saying there. He says, but I have come that they may have what? Life, zoe, and have it abundantly. He has come so that you and I can have life forever with God and life abundantly, overflowingly. This is a qualitative aspect of our life. God wants us to experience a great quality of life. Here's the best quality of life you can ever have. I'm going to give it to you. It's not being rich. It's not being wealthy. It's not uh, you know, being healthy. Although all of those things are so fun. They're great. They're blessings. Here's the greatest quality of life you can ever have. You as a human being, as a believer, in the full beam of God's presence forever. When you and I step into eternity, the scripture makes it clear, to be apart from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you and I step, step out of this body and go into the presence of God, you and I will enjoy the full rays of his glorious presence forever. Now that's the best quality of life you're ever going to have. That will transform you through and through. And then, the resurrection. Hallelujah. And so the scripture says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 53, here's how Paul put it. He says, now this is what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, about the resurrection. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He says, nor does the perishable, that which can perish, inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a secret. Want in on it? Here it is. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the blinking of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed, for this perishable body must put on imperishable and this mortal mortal body must put on immortality. What is he saying there? Here's the source of your life. The source of this new life in resurrection that you and I will have is divine. And God imparts his life to you and I, but it doesn't make you divine. It makes you immortal, and those are two separate things. You and I become immortal in the sun. We become immortal, which means we live forever, and we live in the light and the glory and the abundance of his life-giving power. Amen? Let's pray. Will you pray with me? Bow your head. Close your eyes, if you will. The gospel is good news. It's great news. And the news is good because Jesus has risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead and all those who believe in God's one and only son. Who have entrusted their very lives to him and this message. You will live forever and you will live in blissful abundance in his presence. You will. The story of Advent, the story of Christmas is that story. It is the story of how God came to earth. God came from heaven to earth to seek and to save those who are lost. And this is how much God loved the world. 
He so highly valued and esteemed the people of this world that he sent his one and only unique son, who was God the Son, to be born, to be placed in a lowly horse trough, to be raised in obscurity in backwater Nazareth, to reveal God's power and glory as his anointed, beloved son, to die a dishonorable death as a criminal and a blasphemer on a Roman cross, to raise to life again so that you and I may have life forever and ever. Will you receive that message right now? If you're in agreement and the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes to the truth of it, would you just put your trust in it? Put your trust in it. Put your trust in him because he is the only source of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 